Okay, well, let me start with an introduction then. And uh, it's one that's nice to, to be in Washington and talking to a bunch of Canadian farmers. I like that idea a lot. Uh, I, but I, I was curious why you didn't, why you stopped here and didn't go further south where it probably is a little warmer. Uh, and and I, I, when, when I was called to ask if I'd like to talk, uh, um, I think there was a, a lot of silence on the end of my line. And I said, well, where is this? And they said, in DC. I said, oh, I'll be there. Okay. Uh, but I actually have been up to uh, Saskatoon, Regina, uh, Winnipeg, a number of places giving talks before. You may have seen me before, or if nothing else, may have seen me in, in Geneva um, back during the tail end of the Doha negotiation from 2007 to 2008. I was the chief ag negotiator there and worked very, very closely with uh, uh, your negotiator in Napa, Steve Rahul. And I think you guys uh, should be very happy uh, to have him representing you uh, in these negotiations. He's a, a great guy, but a, but a great negotiator as well. And I, in what I see are some pretty tough negotiations. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk. I, I know the, the thing says uh, NAFTA and the WTO. I'm going to mainly talk about NAFTA, although there's plenty to talk about in the WTO. It's just that I don't have, I only have 20 minutes, and I'm already probably three minutes down on that count. Um, WTO, obviously, there's a lot that's not going on there, um, just in the sense that we had a sent, uh, bunch of negotiations uh, are ministerial that really didn't uh, do very much and largely because the U.S. was disengaged in that ministerial. And I think that, that um, uh, worse, we have an appellate body in the dispute settlement that is not, uh, is right now hamstrung by the fact that the, their new members haven't been appointed. That also is a, uh, something that, that is due to the U.S. inaction on that. Um, and so during question and answers, I'd be happy to do that, but I think what I'm going to do is start with, um, so let's see, it's not that one. Ah, there it is. So I'm just going to talk a little about NAFTA. And I, I mean, this has been a wild year here. I'm sure it's been entertaining to watch from uh, the other side of the border and, and sometimes frightening too. Uh, but uh, it's just to say we've, you know, uh, the first week of the administration we pulled out a TPP, which unfortunately, uh, you know, for, for U.S. farmers in particular was a good deal. Um, and not only do we lose those gains, uh, we'll, at least if, if some of the analysis I've seen, we'll lose some preference um, to the TP11. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Uh, I see we're, the President recently has talked about maybe getting back into TPP. Um, I hope that's the case, and, and hopefully we can get, uh, uh, I'm not sure I want to negotiate that one, but hopefully uh, uh, get back in and that, that will go on. But then, then as, as, as Marvin mentioned, almost immediately we also talked about withdrawing from NAFTA, withdrawing from the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement, all these things that, that agriculture at least has been very, very concerned about. And, and I'd say these, these trade tensions exist within the administration too, although Frankly, and, I, and I've worked 30 years in federal government and worked for 15 of those years for Republicans and 15 years for Democrats. And I think normally you look at the trade reps office and commerce and agriculture as being real proponents of, of, of free trade and, and generally um, advocating uh, uh, moves in, um, you know, towards trade liberalization. Here's a case where um, I think these gentlemen on, on the left, you probably know, uh, Bob Lighthizer, of course the President, Wilbur Ross, and then Peter Navarro, who just recently has been, uh, at least the word is, is he's been elevated in his role in trade policy within the White House and is, is really perceived as a, a real uh, hawk, I guess is, I'm not sure what that word means in this context, but um, uh, certainly is very much anti-China um, and, and is a general believer that the U.S. has done poorly in trade deals. So, And on the other side, you, you, Sonny Perdue, who's up at the top there, uh, really has been kind of one of the most vocal members of the certainly the, the Trump cabinet who's been saying, wait a minute, there are people who actually have gained a lot from this agreement and um, uh, we, we really should do no harm here. And um, in a, in a pretty highly publicized um, 
stories at least, uh, when the first announcement was, were made by the president that he was gonna pull out of NAFTA, the secretary went over there, showed him the map of where uh, his support had been during the, the election and said these are guys who, who helped a lot by NAFTA. And that seemingly made a, 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 an impression at least for a while. And then uh, also US Free Trade Agreement uh, also came in very strong. The other one, one down there is Gary Cohn, who's also a, 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 is at the National Economic Council within the White House, also has been a big proponent for trade. And, and those guys, um, you know, you, you, week to week this sort of varies in terms of who seems to have the upper hand. Again, with the, the, the recent announcement of, of Peter Navarro uh, uh, getting elevated, uh, it raises some concerns, and certainly with, with uh, now we have the, these big actions on aluminum and steel that are looming. Um, uh, again, there's a lot of, lot of interest in just in terms of what will happen over the next few weeks. Okay, so uh, I do want to talk, let me talk a little about wheat. Wheat's important. Uh, obviously, Canada, U.S. have been big, big players in the wheat market um, overall. You can see both of our Canada, certainly less so than the U.S. U.S. market share in world markets has been declining a lot over the last uh, several years. Um, Canada has been more flat, I'd say, but the big uh, change here, of course, is the, the emergence of the Black Sea, uh, and that actually has had a big impact on, on world markets, where the Black Sea has really been taking most of the growth in, that, in those markets in terms of consumption. And, and again, uh, I, I think the fact that Canada has held its own is is pretty good, what the, but I, I think important here, at least for the U.S. is concerned, you often hear about the lack of competitiveness of U.S. wheat producers, and I think that there's some truth in it, but the competitiveness isn't with other wheat producers. I think the competitiveness has been uh, towards corn and soybeans, and I know you've seen some of that in Canada as well with, with uh, canola and other things that have taken out some of that wheat area um, where, where some uh, farmers have, have switched over, but in the U.S. it's really been dramatic, and that, this, if I'd uh, taken this back to 1980, it would see even a, a larger decline. But, but really with um, uh, the one, just the fact that, that prices for grains and oil seeds have, have increased so much over the last few years, the fact that we've seen continued yield developments in corn, and more importantly, varieties that now can be grown, short season varieties that can be grown even up in the Dakotas. Um, and then the other thing is the big push on oil seeds, soybeans in particular, westward and did places like Kansas and other things that would be growing more winter wheat. And winter wheat, you know, is, is at a almost, uh, I forget what year you have to go back to now, but it, it's, um, it's been declining for a number of years and, and I think early 1900s or maybe even late 1890s now, um, uh, our, our winter wheat area uh, is back to those levels. Okay. Uh, and this, this shows, at least for the U.S., what our major markets are. And some of these, of course, we compete with you guys in. But the interesting thing, and I hope it shows up there, these are, of course, a lot of these countries are countries that um, <coughs> are in danger of, of at least with, with uh, some of the trade agreement or the trade rhetoric that we've heard. You know, Mexico shows up large. Uh, South Korea shows up large. China, which has been a small market for us but occasionally does, I think, a lot of hope for our producers. Uh, as you know, the U.S. launched a domestic support case against, the China, uh, against China last year and also a, a TRQ case against them in the WTO with the hope of getting more in those markets. And then even Europe, uh, uh, again, with the recent actions and, and the 301 actions on intellectual property, there's a concern that, that they too would be problems. And I might add, if you go down the list, you see a lot of other free trade agreements like Central America Free Trade Agreement where a lot of other countries um, uh, take place. Now, if, if you were a corn producer or a, wheat or a soybean producer, I would have shown some of these other ones and, and they're as dramatic if not more so, but um, uh, just to say producers are very concerned. Uh, I just looked at, at kind of Google Trends uh, just to see how often it was showing up in, in uh, Google count hits. And again, at election time, certainly, I mean, the uh, interesting thing to me is that both candidates uh, were against TPP, both had rhetoric, uh, and, and in, particularly if you include Bernie Sanders in the mix, uh, uh, you know, most of the major candidates complaining about free trade agreements. Um, but again, the, at, at least for the time being, it's down 
thankfully uh, down at a little uh, lower level, although I, I presume if the rhetoric heats up on that again, that we'll see a big uh, jump in the, the, the news things. Okay, I'm rapidly running out of time, so let me move through some of this stuff. I think you guys have all seen these sorts of charts. Uh, Canada, U.S. doing uh, very similar business, I think, since uh, Custis started uh, in the late 80s. Um, we've seen a, a big growth in trade uh, between both countries. Uh, that's true with Mexico as well. Uh, we've, we've run a little bit of a, a, this is just agricultural trade, we've run a little bit of a, a deficit with, with Mexico recently just because uh, grains and oilseed prices have fallen a lot more than, say, prices for beer and, and fruits and vegetables, uh, which we tend to import a lot from, from Mexico. Um, the mix of business, again, not surprising between U.S. and Canada. There's a lot of consumer-ready products. Um, but the other thing that, that is that middle category, those are intermediate products. Those are things that go into processing. And I think Marvin mentioned in his talk just how integrated some of our economies have become. And so you see a lot of things like feeder cattle and uh, feeder pigs and um, uh, you know, soybean meal and all sorts of things going across the border um, that are going into pro, uh, uh, production processes. And then, yes, there's still a lot of bulk, commodity, bulk trade, uh, particularly between the U.S. and Mexico, where we ship a lot of wheat, corn, and soybeans uh, there. This is just uh, our trade profile with Canada. Um, you can see, again, as, as I mentioned, there's a lot of processed products in, in the mix on both of those towards the bottom of the chart. You can see the feeds, horticultural products, um, beverages, that sort of thing. Um, with Mexico, oh, I, I did want to show wheat imports from Canada. Uh, threw that one in. Uh, again, I, I don't think anything out of the ordinary. Um, I, <laughs> It's interesting, I remember telling a lot of people that I thought that, that uh, for all the battles the U.S. had and, uh, against the Canadian Wheat Board, I, I used to argue that that was Canada's problem, that actually I pr probably in the absence of Wheat Board War would be flowing across the border. Um, and that looks like that might be the case, although it's, those are pretty small numbers. Um, and, and again, with the declining wheat production in the U.S., uh, one could expect actually uh, to, to uh, that mills and other things would be sourcing more wheat from Canada. The other thing, um, uh, again, with our bilateral trade with Mexico, I mentioned that we have a lot of uh, uh, big bulk commodities that are going their way, like corn, soybeans, and, and other things. Um, for the U.S., big thing is fruits and vegetables that we're importing from Mexico. I, I like to point out to people that we tend to talk about NAFTA in these sorts of groups when I'm talking to producers that, yeah, we're real concerned about exports to both Canada and Mexico, but we're also, as consumers, should be really concerned about what we're importing from, uh, that, that the fact that these, these uh, trade agreements may hamper imports. Because you, if you look at when Mexico, for example, ships us uh, fruits and vegetables, you can see that it's mainly counter-seasonal. It's mainly coming in our winter, mar uh, winter months when we're, not hot, when we're not harvesting, and really has created you know, year-round availability of fruits and vegetables in, in, in the U.S. Uh, if you look at things like per capita consumption of fresh vegetables or per capita consumption of blueberries or, or uh, fresh uh, uh, fruits, you see that, that generally those things are going up over the last few years. There's, uh, yes, and it's true that import penetration has gone up too, but again, I, I would argue that these things are mainly counter-seasonal and that they're mainly uh, uh, to the benefit of U.S. consumers. Uh, this shows pretty dramatic just in terms of per capita consumption that, that domestic uh, consumption or production actually is fairly flat. And remember, this is per capita and population actually is increasing in the U.S. So production on these commodities actually is going up, but that, that a, a greater share of the, what's being consumed is, is now coming from, or I shouldn't say great, of the increase in what's being consumed. Uh, most of that's being met by imports. Um, the other thing is our, uh, we have a lot of, of uh, food processing companies that are doing business in Canada, a lot in Canada that are doing business in the US. Uh, and we do a lot in Mexico as well, a little bit of Mexican uh, food processing uh, uh, sales in the US. But I primarily, uh, if you look at the Canada numbers, you know, I think they're very, they're proportionate. They're not, not nearly as large as the U.S., but certainly proportionate in size. And um, uh, again, these are important things about uh, trade integration and other things that we've seen. 
Um, this just shows uh, one of our big um, uh, fruit vendors or uh, uh, commercial operations in the U.S. Driscoll's, which I don't know if you get in, in or if they sell in um, Canada as well. But I think what, this is right off their website. It just shows you where they buy all this all this stuff and at what time during the year. And you see that they're buying from 10 or 15 U.S. states at times. They're certainly uh, sourcing from B.C. They're sourcing from Mexico. They're sourcing from Peru. It's just that these value chains have really grown. And I think, again, I would argue to the benefit of, of, of U.S. consumers. Okay, so now we get to uh, things that probably hit you more directly, and that's uh, the livestock production, uh, the integration there. And, and we know from, from a WTO case just what sort of damages would be involved with uh, a restraint of trade in, in, in that. I mean, just even country of origin labeling, which, which caused problems just at the, um, you know, for, for looking at muscle cuts. But if you're really talking about increasing tariffs on a number of items going across border that, that you're really talking about big, big, big values that, that um, are, uh, people stand to lose, not just in, in uh, and, and changing the way things are sourced. Um, here is just sh shows uh, for Mexico and what their MFN rates are, what Canada's MFN rates are and US MFN rates. And I'd just like to point out that, that there are a lot. Uh, I singled out the Canada's dairy here, but believe me, U.S. has some dairy lines that are very, very high themselves. The, um, and uh, uh, that, and these are these are these are averages across those things. So the U.S. certainly has dairy lines that are in similar territory as, as some of the dairy lines that, that Canada has. Um, the other big complaint uh, that the administration has made is on dispute settlement. They don't like the idea that, that one can challenge a, a, a U.S. trade remedy law by going to a third party like what, what's available under Chapter 19 or what's available under the dispute settlement body in, in the WTO. What, what's interesting to me is how many companies and commodity groups and others have come out and said publicly that actually this is a big benefit to them as well. because. Uh, they don't like the fact that, that a country may impose something and what they feel is unfair. They like the idea that they're given a, a venue where they can go and, and uh, argue about those uh, um, uh, uh, imp imposition of those tariffs or, or other duties. And, and so I think that, and I think the other thing is you can see that the U.S. just here, and I'm, uh, this isn't a broader thing on WTO, it's just in, involving NAFTA either through Chapter 19 or the, or the WTO. And you can see that the U.S. has you know, raised a lot of these and, is, and I'd argue has, has benefited a lot from dispute settlement. Um, oh, don't want to go there yet. A little preview. Okay, so let me just conclude real quickly. I, you know, I, I think the, the overall negotiations, I think, are, are very difficult. Marvin started with saying, uh, talking about modernization of NAFTA. And absolutely, this, this agreement is 25 years old. I was involved with some of the negotiations on it. I was around for CUSTA, but frankly wasn't, wasn't at all involved with, with those talks. And actually, they were pretty quick. But, but here's a case where, um, you know, sure, there's a lot of things that could be done uh, in improving uh, uh, NAFTA, um, and, and particularly e-commerce, particularly uh, some of these areas that have grown substantially um, since the, you know, the mid-90s and, or late 80s, mid-90s when these things were negotiated. Uh, but I think things like market ga access gains, I, they're going to be tough. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're U.S. Uh, dairy industry, rightly, I think, is focused on, on uh, you know, supply management. They'd like to see that ended. I have my own views on supply management, but I just don't think, I mean, as a negotiator, I know that those things come at a price. And so, you know, I, I, it's unclear whether or not uh, we would even think about doing sugar, but uh, I mean, that's the sort of thing, big ticket item, that when you talk about sugar here in the U.S., people say, oh yeah, they don't like that. And so I understand the, uh, the, the difficulty in, in, in sort of working through these sorts of negotiations. Uh, and we saw in TPP, you know, what, what could one could get out of that in a, in a multilateral negotiation. So 
Um, there, there has been a lot of talk, at least initially, when, when these talks were first introduced, uh, you had producers in Florida who said, gee, you know, we don't really like the fact that Mexico fruits and vegetables come in, um, you know, during the springtime. Now, I, and I said that mainly they're counter-seasonal. They are, but they overlap a little bit with some of the Florida uh, production. And so what they were advocating is saying, well, what if we could just put on a duty for one month? You know, and, and, and look at harm over just that one month. And, you know, that's a pretty slippery slope. Uh, you could see where someone in BC might think the same thing uh, about, you know, whatever produce is coming up from the US. Um, you could see where certainly uh, Chihuahua apple producers, which there are some, uh, would also look at the fact that we'd be sending apples down their way during a certain part of the year. And so, I, luckily, that seems to be falling off the table, although I, I'm not all that close to the negotiations. I don't know if that thing could come up. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of things to do on the modernizing NAFTA. I think some of this was already in play before the uh, uh, negotiations started. But my big concern is, I think, that particularly for agriculture, because agriculture and in, in, in Secretary Purdue has just been great about saying, do no harm to agriculture, get it, you know, being very vocal. I don't think the harm's gonna come from agriculture. Again, I think the agriculture negotiations, yeah, they're, you know, uh, if you put as your goal that you wanna, uh, uh, you know, get rid of uh, supply control, uh, that's gonna be a tough negotiation. But if, if you look at just generally what's going on in, in uh, uh, agriculture, I think TPP lays out a pretty good course to how to move those, those negotiations along. But the real ones are the ones that, that I think Marvin alluded to, uh, things like rules of origin and domestic content requirements. You know, we've had this long-standing dispute on softwood lumber. I worked on that in an early phase of my career back in the early 90s. Um, uh, chapter 19, as I mentioned, all these things, I think, if those are ultimately what comes out, or if those you know, precipitate or withdrawal from NAFTA, then I think agriculture is the big, big loser out of that. But as I keep saying to people, the, from the US standpoint, and, and frankly, this involves you too, because this is tying up, um, as Marvin alluded to, a lot of resources from Ottawa <coughs> to negotiate an agreement that essentially is negotiated, or, you know, has been negotiated. So, Rather than being out there negotiating future agreements and other things, we're, we're spent you know, treading water here or, or at worst moving backwards. So now I'll give you a, a slim pickings and Brad will bomb down on Dr. Strangelove. But um, yeah, so I hope all things work out. Uh, you know, it, at times I think what, what, what is impressive is the ag groups in the US have been very, very unified and very vocal. Um, I can tell you there were times when, when Steve Verhul and I were in, in, in Geneva uh, working through various aspects of that agreement uh, that, that didn't come to fruition. But I, I, one of the difficult things was getting, at least in my case, getting my producers really interested in it. And, and you know, you'd say, well, we got all these tariff reduction potential or tariff quota uh, creation in, in Europe. You know, and they say, well, yeah, but we have all those SPS issues. Or we have all, you know, we have this problem with hormones or we have this problem. And I get all that, the, the, um, the, but you just had the sense that no one was even interested in trade. And now I think people are very much interested in trade. And they're talking more and more about other trade agreements and how we need to get back on track. So that's been good. I think the political support from this outside of the White House um, it has also been very, very good. So hopefully saner minds prevail at the end and we get a good agreement and we get a modernization. So with that, let me stop and take questions later.